Good morning, everyone. Welcome back, and um, welcome to a fabulous session where we'll be exploring the intersection of psychology and sociology. Um, and we have a terrific panel, including Jeremy Cohan, Roberta Garner, Julia Hahn, Blackhawk Hancock, and Gary Walls. Each, so we're going to have four presentations, uh, approximately 15 minutes each, which should leave us with about an hour of conversation. And we're going to start with Jeremy Kahan, who is uh, a PhD candidate at NYU uh, in sociology, studying uh, politics and class consciousness. He directs the analytic social psychology group here uh, in the um, society and is also familiar with plans. So, Jeremy? On two fronts, these notes are sort of initial and might be a little messy. On one front, um, they're the initial sort of culling together of conversations we in the Society for Psychoanalytic Recruit have been having for about a year. Um, so they're somewhat provisional on that front. And then the other front is just uh, limited time, so some things might be very concentrated. Um, if that's the case, you can stop me and ask me to explain, or please feel free to ask any questions. Um, Okay, so as I said, these are some notes uh, towards orienting our work in the Analytic Social Psychology Working Group um, that's a part of SPOT. Uh, our mission is to inquire into the conditions, problems, and possibilities of contemporary social science research with an emancipatory intent. What I present here are initial reflections prompted by orienting discussions that we've been undertaking. Uh, the Frankfurt School was a grouping of intellectuals around the Institute for Social Research that, beginning in the 1920s, devoted themselves to independent Marxist research, unaffiliated with any particular party. The general orientation of their work, I believe, had a great deal of consistency from the time Max Horkheimer took up the directorship of the Institute in 1931 until Theodore Adorno's death in 1968. Their mission, to engage in research in the, into the, contemporary, the nature of contemporary domination. What ties us to how things are when they so clearly could be otherwise? Herbert Marcuse offered this helpful description of their basic orientation. Quote, the Institute had set itself the task of elaborating a theoretical conception which was capable of comprehending the economic, political, and cultural institutions of modern society as a specific historical structure from which the prospective trends of development could be derived. This undertaking was based on certain notions common to all members of the staff, notably that a theory of history was the prerequisite for an adequate understanding of social phenomena, and that such a theory would provide the standards for an objective critique of given social institutions, which would measure their function and their aims against the historical potentialities of human freedom. We tried to find the answer to the terrible question why human freedom and happiness declined at the stage of mature civilization when the objective conditions for their realization were greater than ever before. Um, there's one other quick sort of self-description I want to give, which was by a, an associate, not a member, um, Alfred Zohn-Rethel, who wrote a very interesting book called Intellectual and Manual Labor, but he gave this account, which is a little more political. Um, he saying about himself, he said, my investigation began towards the end of the First World War and its aftermath, at a time when the German proletarian revolution should have occurred and tragically failed. This period led me into personal contact with Ernst Bloch, Walter Benjamin, Max Horkheimer, Siegfried Krakauer and Theodore W. Adorno, and the writings of Georg Lukash and Herbert Marcuse, either as members themselves or influences on the Frankfurt School. Strange though it may sound, I do not hesitate to say that the new development in Marxist thought, which these people represent, evolved as the theoretical and ideological superstructure of the revolution that never happened. In it we echo the thunder of the gun battle for the Marschall in Berlin at Christmas 1918, and the shooting of the Spartacus rising in the following winter. So much for descriptions. Uh, Adorno remarked once that the fundamental task of sociology is to understand what holds this society together, despite the seeming chaos and individuation on its surface. This question is motivated by the experience of the age as one of immense contradiction between the objectively possible and the actual. Human beings could be free from toil, instead we are faced by the need to work as a fact of life. The means for mental stimulation are available more readily ever than before in history, yet we stupefy ourselves. The hold of old institutions over the individual family, church, craft, has profoundly weakened, yet dependence on state and society are everywhere in evidence. This experience of the real contradiction that characterizes the social order both necessitated the questions the Frankfurt School would ask and dictated some of the method they would pursue to investigate it. As Adorno put it, quote, they accept the ridiculous situation which every day, in the face of the open possibility of happiness, 
threatens them with avoidable catastrophe. What role then for psychoanalysis? Death psychology takes as its explanandum the individual and her suffering. For explanons, Freud offered animal drives, for instance, and the internal dynamic conflicts within the individual. How could analysis do anything more than orient itself towards a given individual, and thus, perhaps, duplicate bourgeois ideology with its persistent tendencies towards personalizing abstract dynamics? Of great concern to any Marxist in the early 20th century was the fact of mass participation and reaction. This was particularly acute in the German working class's willingness to fall behind the call of God and country and fight for their slave masters in the Holocaust of World War I, nor was it the worst Holocaust of that century. Psychoanalysis seemed to offer some conceptual basis for understanding what Marxists sometimes refer to as the lag between the productive forces and the relations of production, or between the base and the superstructure. To put it in non-jargon, or less jargony terms, why could you get mass new possibilities of production and social crisis, the old order tottering and a new one waiting to be born, and here we are murdering one another? For analytically oriented social psychology, part of the explanation might be sought in the formation of the individual in the society. Um, let me present a number of somewhat paradoxical statements to help us orient ourselves towards the broader theoretical concerns. And then I'll talk some about the empirical research, because I'm particularly interested in how these work together, and I think it's a forgotten element of what they were doing. So here's uh, the theoretical concerns. Number one, uh, the society, our society, is founded on objective economic laws and on the power of the police that hold the individual in place. Yet, we have in truth no way of knowing their strength. We do not test their limits for the most part. We become them. Number two, the objective conditions for self-determinations as individuals and as a society as a whole are more in our hands than ever the case. Yet, we are democratic heteronomists. We love our heteronomy. Three, projects for self-determination must begin resolutely with the realities. And the realities are not always propitious. Um, just to say a tiny bit more about that, uh, the Frankfurt School were particularly interested in the future directions of democratic education and of politics. And they thought consistently projects for education and projects for political change based themselves on incredibly outdated thinking about the human personality and the kinds of society, the kind of society we were living in. Um, so again, this confrontation with the realities of the personalities of our time was the fundamental basis for any projects for self-determination self -determination through education, through politics, through organization, through um, self-activity. Uh, number four, adaptation to the struggle for existence and the instinct of self-preservation explain the character of this society. But the persistence of the struggle for existence is a scandal, is unnecessary, and its experience produces scarring and psychic pain. Five, the antagonism between the individual and society is real. That contradiction, however, is being solved regressively by history. Six, psychoanalysis is a historical product. Yet, it registered the character of the time precisely by being untimely, by its uncompromising inquiry into the archaic inheritance still present within us, and its resolute expose of the substitute satisfactions that tie us to our suffering. Seven, fear is the basis of the current social order. Often, however, this is a fear of possibility, a fear of freedom, more than a fear of actuality though it always bears the marks of the current powers. And then eight, um, the true is the whole, and the whole is false. <laughs> this is uh, Marcuse's paraphrase of a German phrase. Um, these theoretical views, uh, again, extremely condensed, condensed, so please feel free to ask me about them. I'll maybe expand a little later if I have time. Um, these theoretical views were both theoretical premises and conclusions. Premises in that they offer key categories, themselves not subject to any rigid verificationism, as foundational for research and inquiry. Given the attempt of critical research to observe the invisible, possibility, subjectivity, change, the categories could never be reduced to positivist observables. Yet these were also conclusions, in that they based themselves on ambitious research, individually and collectively, into the state of the contemporary person, as formed by contemporary social institutions. 
The empirical research the Institute undertook is often neglected, seen as little more than a tool to legitimate themselves in a hostile academic world, particularly when they arrived in America and had to establish themselves as exiles. This, I think, would be a fundamental misunderstanding. Recognizing the objectivizing and manipulative character of much of social research in a bad society, Adorno was put to work, for instance, when he got to the United States in the Princeton Radio Project, um, which basically did market research on what people were listening to on the radio, uh, something he was unsurprisingly not very congenial towards and didn't last long doing. <clears throat> um, so though there is this objectivizing character, manipulative character to a lot of social research, um, you, you know, good jobs outside the academy, you go into marketing um, or the manipulation of the masses. The school also undertook empirical research that would help orient future projects for human self-determination. As I said, they were especially concerned with the prospects for education and for radical politics, given the character of their time. Fascism, a participatory dictatorship, itself the highest product of industrial civilization, raised deep questions. Um, I want to say something brief then about the four large projects or studies that they undertook. Um, the first was called the Studies on Authority of the Family, which undertook to understand the family structures of the German working class and their effects on the character structures prevalent at the time. Taking the work of radical analysts like Fenichel, Reich, and Fromm as a point of departure, they sought to understand the forces that selected for the predominant character structures of the day. So it's sort of like a Darwinian metaphor. There are all sorts of different character structures that might emerge, but there are these selecting forces, institutions like the family structure, that select certain kinds of character types that then become predominant in the society and hold back the possibility of change. Uh, they laid out in this study some of their very basic concepts of their theory of late capitalism, uh, characterized by the big combine, the rise of the white collar working class, the decline of the petty bourgeoisie, the weakening of the family, the rise of mass education and mass entertainment, and in their view, the weakening of the independent personality. It would prove foundational, this study, for the rest of their efforts. The second major study they undertook was called the Working Class in Weimar Germany. Um, it was a study of the white collar and blue collar working class of Weimar Germany, led by Eric Fromm. Analysis, again, psychoanalysis played a significant role here in the attempt to look at broader attitudes towards sexuality and the family as indicative of orientations perhaps invisible to direct questions about political ideas. Furthermore, interviewers were asked, were analyzed, sorry, interviews were analyzed analytically. That is, defenses, tics, over-emotive reactions were all treated in depth fashion. So rather than the typical positivist research um, design in understanding subjective opinions, basically trusting what people say about themselves, the goal was to use the kind of you know, techniques of suspicion of psychoanalysis to better understand the things people really thought about themselves that they might not even admit to themselves, certainly wouldn't admit to a researcher in a lab coat. The conclusions of the study led the Institute to note that even workers wedded to Marxist revolutionary ideals or more liberal progressive ideologies were somewhat superficially committed. They suppressed the results for fear that this would only help further discredit the left on the eve of fascism. They would later claim the dubious privilege of having been some of the few social scientists to predict the rise of fascism in Germany. Um, the third study, or project they embarked on, is called the Studies on Prejudice, a series that undertook to study the techniques of fascist mass manipulation, um, fascist and generally far right wing mass manipulation, and the kinds of people susceptible to such work. The studies of fascist propaganda took as theoretically fundamental Freud's account of the archaic but powerful character of group psychology in his group psychology and the analysis of the ego. They also use Freud's theories on paranoid projection to try to understand widespread race prejudice, including anti-Semitism, so central to the work of National Socialism. Often what they noted were the standardized tropes pulled out for every occasion in fascist propaganda, themselves not remarkably different from techniques of mass culture. As for the other side, so they researched sort of the propaganda from above. From below, they, re they produced a study called the Authoritarian Personality, probably the most famous of their empirical studies. Um, Taking the work, uh, I said that already. Um, so, sort of moving on from the uh, studies on authority in the family, they took the idea of the advent of a new character type as their point of departure. In their view, the authoritarian personality was a type produced by late capitalism um, who had, among other things, these characteristics rigid in his thinking, paranoid, given to uncritical worship of authority as such, hating art and imagination and all forms of fantasy. Um, and a great deal of disguised sadism. He was characterized by ego-weakness, uh, 
quote, no longer capable of dealing with the demands of self-determination in the face of overpowering social forces and institutions. Finally, uh, their last major study was called a group experiment. Upon returning to Germany, the institute conducted hundreds of group interviews wherein the group was given the stimulus of a fictional letter by an American about post-war Germany and post-war German politics. And their spontaneous responses and group dynamics were used to understand the ideological formations that often emerge in emotionally tinged interactions rather than individual reason self-reflection. Much of the results were processed through Freud's concept of defense, that the Germans showed a, you know, intensely defensive character in talking about their recent past and the history of fascism. The school found that democratic ideas, in their view, had far less hold on Germans than various self-congratulatory American social scientists had been led to believe. Um, these large projects were supplemented by Adorno's studies of mass culture. He wrote, for instance, draft critiques of NBC's Music Appreciation Hour, and many associate studies of the white collar working class, and more. The Frankfurt School's orientation came from the difficulties of revolutionizing the society of their moment. Analytic thinking, in their view, was one of the sharpest tools at cutting through the contemporaneous bullshit. It offered key categories resistance, projection, Substitute satisfaction, renunciation, destructive instincts, ego weakness. It raised the cry of the individual as the individual was being overwhelmed with pressures from all sides for dissolution. Freud, as well, saw the rot at the core of civilization with acuteness. The core of civilization being power and domination. But Adorno, especially in his essay on sociology and psychology, insisted that there could be no immediate unity between sociology and psychology they retain their, a, a form of productive tension. Only the tension between the socially determined reality principle and the diminished but suffering individual, understood as a real contradiction of the society, might allow us to grasp, grasp hold of possibilities. I want to end uh, really quickly. How am I doing Good, okay. Uh, and really quickly, just on a, a few questions that we then in the analytic social psychology study group have been posing to think about what it would mean to try to take up this legacy for the present we're interested in doing. One, how relevant is psychic structure for explaining contemporary compliance? The Frankfurt School had key objective conditions we do not. Widespread radical ideologies, a recent transformation from another society into this one that preserved the memory of a different order, large-scale self-organized forms in which the masses participated and through which they demanded autonomy. The forces of production, on the other hand, are more right than ever. So what role do analytic concepts play in understanding a moment where the objective seems totally self-contained as explanation and as reality? Two, what are the contours of contemporary socializing institutions? How stand family, school, mass culture, and who are the individuals they create? You might recognize the sort of, the, the motive for this part of the, um, the uh, program, um, Sicilian test. Uh, three, does the theory of character still have validity for the present? If so, what are the predominant character types of the present? Four, is the fear of our moment internalized in the same forms confronted by the Frankfurt School? Hate and fear transformed to love and prejudice, uh, love of nation, love of leader, etc. How do we understand the prevalent cynicism of our time and the real amelioration of race prejudice? That we know everything is false, does this bring us closer to the true? Why don't we know what we know? Finally, five, under what conditions do members of the society occasionally break out of their self-enclosed shells? As we trundle on towards the end times, we in the analytic social psychology study group try to understand the people of our time, not as the only beginning, but as a beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. All right. Um, next, we will be hearing from uh, professors uh, Roberta Garner and Black Hawk Hancock, uh, both professors of sociology at uh, DePaul University. Um, it's wonderful to have Professor Garner back at the University of Chicago, back home, uh, where uh, she, uh, because Professor Garner studied with uh, Morris Janowitz and Bruno Bettelheim here. Uh, and so that's uh, really exciting to have. Here. And um, Black Hawk Hancock is uh, also a professor of sociology at DePaul and author of a forthcoming book, uh, American Allegory, Lindy Hop, and the Racial Imagination, which will be coming out at the University of Chicago Press any day now. Okay. All right. And we'll be talking about the relationship between Goffman and Freud.
We'll call this nostalgic, romantic, retro. In this paper, we will reflect on a time when there was still a lot of content, almost a primal unity among sociology, social psychology, psychiatry, and psychoanalysis. A sort of boundaryless, polymorphous, perverse flow of ideas across weakly defined edges of these fields. We will argue that this interplay of perspectives was not only beneficial to participating fields, but also carried a strong charge of social activism, questioning of social arrangements, and critical evaluation of social order in terms of both structural effects and effects on individual human beings. The psychoanalytic and the social psychological critique complemented the structural one. We begin with an essay by John Seeley, which was first published in 1965, whose title seems utterly startling today, The Psychiatrist as Reluctant Revolutionary. Seeley remarks that psychiatrists are seen as subversive, that they are reluctant revolutionaries. See quote one for this. In the post-war period, sociologists, anthropologists, psychologists, psychoanalytic theorists search for links among their disciplines and ways to utilize each other's insights. In turn, these linkages form the basis of a critical view of social institutions and were infused by critical theory, often originating in the work of the Frankfurt Institute. These concerns were not abstract, but rather research engaged with social criticism, public debates, even activism with psychoanalysis at their core. In this paper, we want to follow another thread of this fabric that woke together social science and psychoanalysis in the work of Irving Goffman, going beyond his apparent attack on psychiatry, as his work Asylums has too often been interpreted, to his genuine and profound interest in the questions of self-construction and destruction in social interaction, and the textual and performative qualities of the self, all themes that are shared with psychoanalysis. Too often misread as a straightforward critic of psychiatry or a theorist without an adequate conceptualization of the self, the often psychoanalytic underpinnings remain unexamined. Therefore, our project is to draw out the psychoanalytic forces that structure the two overarching subjects of Goffman's work, the interaction order and the performing self. For Goffman, the interaction order, the normatively governed domain of social life where face-to-face -face interaction occurs, is defined by uncertainty and contingency with the ever-present possibility for suffering, humiliation, dismemberment, and disfigurement. The performative self emerges out of and through the interaction order as a kind of script formed through unconscious forces and traces of the infant and childhood experiences that are transformed into false fantasy stories about the interactions of the infantile past, castrating father, forced recall of seduction, that is then performed in rituals and expressed in neurotic symptoms. For Goffman, the interaction order and the performing self are then co-constituted through a psychodynamic dialectical interplay between self and others, public and private, interior and exterior, which shapes our beliefs, attitudes, understandings, and actions. As a result, Goffman's framework offers us a way to draw a psychoanalytic wedge into the performing self and the interaction order that allows us to individually and collectively understand and shape both ourselves and the interaction order towards more healthy and humane ends. For Goffman, the interaction order must be seen as an arena in which social life unfolds. See quote two. Here we can see Goffman's emphasis on the primacy of the social, for understanding social life and how without irony, the effects that the social brings about in individuals are symptoms, which when extracted and analyzed, can make implicit aspects of social life explicit and exposed. As we will see, the implicit aspects of social life at Goffman's work which we sought to bring to consciousness, awareness, are those standards, those social facts of self, beauty, body, etiquette, style, intelligence, etc., which psychodynamically structure our interpretations, evaluations, orientations, and dispositions, both of the self and of others. These standards, when materialized, are impossible expectations that no one can possibly meet, if ever, let alone all the time. Goffman goes on to write, let's see, quote three here. The interaction order for Goffman rests upon non-discursive practices of social life, which form the taken for granted background of intelligibility and embedded history of social norms that socialize us into the type of selves that we are. The performative self emerges out of and through the interaction order as a kind of script 
through the process of acquisition and socialization, formed through unconscious traces of the infant and childhood experiences that are transformed into stories about the interactions of the past, that is then performed in rituals and expressed in neurotic symptoms. For Goffman, it is here, in the intertwined aspects of interaction order and performing self, that the dialectical psychodynamic self between self and others comes to shape of social and psychic life. Goffman's entire corpus, in fact, and his entire analysis of social life seen in this light, places just as much emphasis on the psychological as it does the sociological. His most theoretical and ambitious work, Frame Analysis, begins with a statement of clarification. See quote four here. As Frame Analysis makes it clear, <coughs> Goffman's project is not social structures and social organizations, rather the organization of experience itself, as well as how that experience is internalized into the individual. While social life may perceive to be foundational to analysis, his focus is on how the individual psychically experiences the social world. Turning to Goffman's most well-known work, The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life, we see that it is the uncertain nature of social life that is the focus of his critique. See quote five. Accordingly, this picture of social life is one where we have nothing but contingency and uncertainty to structure every moment and every situation. And yet Goffman's notion of the self operates on the basis of fitting into what others want us to be. In the process, we are always caught between trying to meet, accommodate, and collaborate with others to be us, and possibly breaking or failing those expectations. For Goffman, our orientation towards life is fulfilling the expectations of others. We forever find ourselves in a seemingly irresolvable tension between the instability of social life, as if we are thrown into a social world not of our own choosing, and the need, desire to make ourselves out of the demands, obligations, and expectations of others. See quote six. In the case of presentation of self, there are at least three modalities of consideration. One, the actor doesn't know what the audience wants. Two, the constant and probable disjunction between what the actor says and what the actor means. And three, the audience doesn't know what the actor wants from them. While uncertainty dominates the interaction order, so does expectation. Expectations are prior to symbolic interactions. We don't negotiate meanings in interactions, since social life is already meaningful and is always already making claims and expectations upon us in each face-to-face -face encounter in the interaction order. While we interact in the interaction order, the meanings of our actions and the actions of others are always worked out ex post facto by reconstructing the meanings of our actions through retrospective interpretation. For Goffman, we are always taking into account our orientations and how we comport ourselves and direct ourselves within and towards others. Therefore, the self is never something unique or autonomous. Rather, it is something that is dependent upon others to realize itself. This dependency suggests a sense of helplessness in which we can view all social interaction as the self's need for attention and approval constantly recreating the dependency and uncertainty of the infancy and early childhood. It is the approval and acknowledgement that the self desires, not the person from whom it is sought or from whom it is received. For Goffman, to be understood is not just about intelligibility. Just as losing face is not just about breakdown in the meaning that needs to be prepared so that interaction can continue. Being understood is intimately linked or is synonymous with embarrassment and humiliation. Humiliation illuminates the deep-rooted superego, telling us to behave and be understood, to belong to the social world, to be a member of social life. Furthermore, the superego reminds us of the constant pressure of interaction, with mistakes and missteps possible at every moment to undermine, discredit, and humiliate us. Balkan's interaction ritual offers further evidence for exploring the interaction order, as we have suggested. See quote seven here. To be humiliated, to not be embarrassed, is not to be diminished in other people's eyes and therefore our own. When the interaction goes according to plan or normatively, we are merely relieved, not satisfied. There is no sense of accomplishment in Balkan's world. There is no sense of success satisfaction or pleasure in abiding in the interaction order. There is only getting along, saving face, 
or alternatively, humiliation, degradation, and at the physical extreme, we're calling edible castration anxiety, dismemberment, and disfigurement. Poignantly evoked here in his quote, a girl from up without a nose from Nathaniel West and his lonely hearts on the opening page of Stigma. See quote eight here. Humiliation, embarrassment, and disfigurement are foundational to social life as they structure or as the anticipation of these emotional state structures. Our thoughts about ourselves, our thoughts about others, our thoughts about others' thoughts about ourselves. These step steps then operate as a constant threat then to dissolving our social bonds with others and therefore the interaction order more generally. In this way, we can see how the interaction order compels us to be constantly aware of our standing in the eyes of others and the judgments of self they imply, which in turn leads us to an almost continuous state of self-consciousness about ourselves. Here, taken to an extreme, is the unending anxiety of any social interaction leading to our embarrassment, humiliation, or disfigurement. To sum up, the self then is a product of interaction with others in infancy and childhood. These others place their expectations on the baby and young child, creating shame, humiliation, guilt, silence, and at the extreme, even a dissociated not me feeling, but the adult's expectations are not met. These experiences form the self in two ways. First, the self is text and false text, where there are ominous silences and omissions in the text, censored places corresponding to extreme and even uncanny feelings of dissociation, accompanying past interactions that lead to the scripting of the false text. The false text is highly libidinally charged, associated with various bodily states, bodily related behaviors, and with interactively expressed negative responses of others. Second, the self is performance. The self is performed in rituals that are dictated, scripted by the false text. These are the neurotic symptoms that to some degree are performed by everyone, but especially intensely and frequently by neurotics. In the process, the self becomes opaque, not only to others, but also to oneself, both for Goffman and in psychoanalytic theory. That is, it can be viewed only through a lens, darkly, and we can only see it in the self-text and self-performances. Therefore, the only way to change the self must begin with a verbal, symbolic action, free association, conducted in an interaction. This interaction is transference, an interaction in which the performance and gestures associated with the initial production of the self are verbally recreated and repeated thereby bringing to light the process in which the initial self-text was produced and the neurotic symptoms, the initial self-performances, were scripted. At first, the repetitive features of this performance are not seen by the patient, but sooner or later the patient grasps that he or she is interacting according to the script, and this makes the initial scripting visible. As psychoanalysis progresses, the transference interaction enables the individual to begin to create a second text, the self-reflective text based on free association interaction with the psychoanalysis. The clash of the two texts, their contradictions and inconsistencies, casts doubt on the first text and ultimately leads to its questioning and eventually to the dispelling, breaking the spell then, of the neurotic symptoms. The new text is linked to new ways of performing the self, ways that are more interactively effective and less linked to humiliation and shame and the negative interactive responses of adults to the child's bodily impulses. Reimagined in this way, psychoanalysis is closely related to interactionist theory and focus on the same terms, the symbolic order, verbal and textual processes, and interaction with adults often in humiliating ways that are repeated as performances that shape subsequent interactions. Goffman's interaction order can be thought of as a two-fold panopticon. However, not the Foucauldian sense of the term. For Goffman, the external social world is one of total visibility. Here, there is no generalized external gaze or sense of surveillance. Rather, we are watching and decoding others while they are doing the same to us in the never-ending crisscrossing glances and feedback loops. Simultaneously, the inner world of the psyche is also defined through its total visibility. 
in our never-ending self-consciousness over all aspects of our behavior that may lead to humiliation, degradation, or disfigurement. This is not simply internalizing the normative order and therefore having our conduct rigidly regulated through that internalization. Rather, it is a non-stop reflexivity or self-awareness that is probing for possible missteps or miscues. Since one is always already in the interaction order, constantly interacting, the double panoptic effect works to reconstitute both self and interaction order simultaneously. Goffman as analyst brings to light our symptoms. In doing so, Goffman's framework offers us a way to drive a psychoanalytic wedge into the performing self and interaction order that allows us to individually and collectively understand and shape both ourselves and that interaction order towards more healthy and humane ends. While we may not be in complete control or be able to change our views of ourselves with simple conscious choice as we perform our symptoms, we can come to see them in a new light, a light which allows us to see them for what they are in order to change them into something that we no longer ritually repeat, <coughs> shrouding our understanding of ourselves to ourselves in the process. Coming full circle, we can see Goffman's as heroes who embody the primal unity among psychoanalysis, social psychology, sociology and critical theory in the 1940s and 50s in the United States. With the anti-psychoanalytical turn within psychology and social psychology, the original unity split apart with the energy and the critical edge of this unified approach to human society and society shattered into separate pieces which are now weaker, more fragmented, and more detached from public engagement. In utilizing Goffman here as a case study in the ways that psychoanalysis and sociology can inform each other, we conclude then by urging scholars and social critics to go beyond nostalgia and propose an actual recombination of these approaches, reconstituting them as a link a set of critical theories with implications for practice. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, our next speaker will be Julia Hahn, uh, who is a student here at the University of Chicago, majoring in philosophy, and uh, who has been uh, working on issues at the intersection of uh, psychoanalysis and uh, post Foucauldian philosophical inquiry. Um, very influenced by the work of Freud, Versani, uh, Jonathan Lear, Candace Fowler. She's writing her thesis on how psychoanalysis reveals flaws in the neo Kantian conception of autonomy, and we'll talk today uh, about the future of psychoanalysis in our post Foucauldian philosophical society. Before I begin discussing Foucault and Freud, I'd just like to express how sincerely honored I am to be here. I spent all last summer reading Leo Bersani and found both his work and psychoanalysis to be hugely transformational in shaping my education. That's not to say that my love of Bersani's work hasn't come with some serious drawbacks and obvious negatives. For instance, in the dating scene, I've come to realize that you'll end up with a lot of unwanted follow-up calls and offers of second dates when you casually mention over dinner that you're currently being a philosopher who encourages you to shatter your current form of experience by going out and having sex. <laughs> Yet, a more serious drawback to enjoying Bersani's work is the intellectual trouble which arises when my proclivity towards psychoanalysis has to face a philosopher like Foucault, whose critical project lands a seemingly inoperable blow to psychoanalysis, completely invalidating its practice. As such, the purpose of this paper is to assess Foucault's relationship to psychoanalysis and examine whether and how psychoanalysis can move forward in the face of Foucault's criticism. By using the very resources Foucault himself employed to criticize psychoanalysis, a method which would examine psychoanalysis as a historical phenomenon, a theory, and a political phenomenon, we are going to assess his relationship to psychoanalysis and ultimately show that his critique does not warrant a rejection of psychoanalysis. The first doubt, the historical doubt, will question whether in practice Freud's writings act as a mechanism of power. The second theoretical doubt will explore whether in theory Freud's, Freud's writings necessarily lead to the historical consequences that they have. And the third political doubt, will investigate what Freud's findings permitted society to achieve and whether such, such accomplishments renders Freud's, 
for your theories worth maintaining. Through this examination, we will begin to open up a conceptual space in which both composed critical projects and Freud's theory of psychoanalysis can coexist. So, let's look at the historical data. Foucault's primary objection to Freud stems from the historical consequences of Freud's work. Specifically, that psychoanalysis leads to a greater saturation of power and the creation of more subjects, meaning both subject as an individual person, i.e. its creation of the hysteric, the neurotic, etc., but also subject as one who is ruled. Foucault insists that psychoanalysis promises that if we can just uncover the mysteries of sex, we'll arrive at some essential truth about ourself. Psychoanalysis does this by its reliance upon the talking cure, essentially extending the act of confession beyond the religious realm and into the medical realm, rendering Western man, quote, a confessing animal. By compelling the individual to confess everything, psychoanalysis uses sexuality to gain control over the individual. Thus, Foucault concludes that analysis, or this medically codified confession, is a technique of subjection. Freudians ultimately must conceive this historical doubt, for psychoanalysis did bring about such historical consequences. It did increase the discourse on sexuality. It did extend the, act of med of, extend the act of confession into the medical realm. It did lead to the creation of new types of subjects, the hysteric, the neurotic, etc. Yet, the validity of this historical doubt does not give Foucaultians sufficient cause to entirely reject psychoanalysis. For close textual analysis will reveal that although Foucault may take issue with the ultimate ideas of sex and power that Freud arrived upon, Freud and Foucault's theories underlying their conceptions do share some common ground. This is what our theoretical, this is what our examination of the theoretical doubt will reveal. So, now turning to the theoretical doubt, we will see that in spite of first appearances, Freud's overall theoretical view of sex actually shares some commonalities with Foucault's. This is demonstrated by Bersani's Foucaultian analysis of Freud's The Three Essays on Sexuality. Foucault's view denies the material objective existence of sex, asserting that sexuality is not some stubborn drive, but rather is a historical construct, an imaginary element which gives power, access, and control over our bodies and its pleasures. Rossani explains that, although proceeding from wholly different analyses, quote, Freud ultimately comes to nearly the same conclusion as Foucault. That is, the founder of psychoanalysis also erase sex from the human body. Persani demonstrates this by focusing on the last sentence of the three essays, which concludes with the quote, unsatisfactory conclusion that we know so little about the essence of sexuality that we are unable to construct an adequate, all-encompassing theory of sexuality. But Persani argues that this is seemingly nonsensical, for up until that final sentence, constructing a Constructing a theory of normal and pathological conditions of sexuality is precisely what the three essays sought to accomplish. Rossani explains this discrepancy by turning to Foucault. Quote, we read in the Foucaultian perspective, Freud's work has been doing something quite different. Specifically, the three essays develops a teleological narrative to explain sexual development, but then, quote, exposes that narrative as pure construction by acknowledging the absence, or at least the unknowability, of sex. Moreover, as we heard Friday evening, Rosani points out that by the end of the three essays, sex has become a property of the entire body, not limited to any specific region, nor even the act of fornication itself, for sexual pleasure can be triggered by reading or riding in trains. All of this serves to indicate a departure from the notions of a material existence of sex and undermines the antisexualist's deployment of sex as a strategy of power, because, quote, the validity of that deployment depends upon there being a knowable sexual essence, a biological referent that Foucault calls sex. All of this ultimately leads Rossani to conclude that, quote, it is as if in the main narrative thrust of the essay, Freud was confirming his role in the history of those strategies of knowledge and power that Foucault calls sexuality. But then, he moves from being one of the cultural objects demystified by Foucault's analysis to himself becoming one of its demystifiers. Thus, psychoanalysis anticipates and performs Foucault's deconstruction of it. <coughs> As such, 
the three essays can be read as an early expression of Foucauldian corporal clearance, quote, stripping the body of its imposed and unnecessary sexual identity. It's important to note that Bersani's aim here is not to demonstrate one way to read one sentence which redeems Freud, but rather, Bersani uses this sentence to illustrate the work Freud is doing against mystification in general. For instance, rather than merely labeling the homosexuals a pervert, Freud is trying to demystify the cultural dogmas of his time, explaining how a homosexual is just an individual whose sexual aim takes a different sexual object than that of the heterosexual, insisting that both sexualities, insisting, insisting that both types of sexualities represent nearly different points along the same path. This is precisely the same work Foucault is doing with his analysis that homosexuals and heterosexuals represent the same form of experience, but take different objects. As such, we can see that both Foucault and Freud are working as demystifiers, striving to break down cultural dogmas. But look, I don't want to overstate the theoretical similarities here, because clearly Foucault and Freud do have very different views, and conflating the two wouldn't do either justice. But what I do want to say is that there seems to be enough striking similarities here as to suggest a connection between the two. So much so that I'm led to question whether perhaps Foucault's theories were shaped by Freud's. And as such, it becomes clear that any reading which takes Foucault to be arguing for a total rejection of psychoanalysis is misguided. I think this comes through most clearly when we examine Foucault's theories on, both of their theories on power. For just as Foucault asserts, that relations of power mean, quote, continuous regulatory and corrective mechanisms, employing infinitesimal surveillances. Freud exhibits similar views with his conception of the psychical agency of the ego ideal. Freud explains that this agency gives one the sense of being watched, as evidenced by the paranoiacs who, quote, complain that all of their thoughts are known and actions watched and supervised. Freud's theory asserts that this agency of power acts by the very same means of constant and ever-present regulation as does Foucault's theory of power. Quote, the paranoiac's complaint is justified. It describes the truth. A power of this kind, knowing, watching, and criticizing all of our intentions, does really exist. Similarly, while Foucault condemns psychoanalysis for its seeming reliance upon a repressive conception of power, upon examining Freud's theory, we find that Freud, like Foucault, ultimately believes power to be productive. Freud argues that this watchman agency, though on the surface appears to act by means of regressive mechanisms and constant no's, is ultimately productive out of this regression. Not only does this power produce the ego and superego, but it also gives rise to a rich inner mental life, as evidenced by dreams which come about by the dominance of censorship. Ultimately, both view power, to quote Foucault, as not something that is bad in itself. Freud thinks a lot of good can come out of power insofar as they lead to possibilities for higher cultural achievements of human society. The problem, Foucault explains, is when power becomes rigid and leads to states of what he calls domination. Foucault asserts that this is what needs to be fought against. But similarly, this is precisely what Freud has been seeking to do through psychoanalysis. It's the aim of psychoanalysis to loosen the states of domination that have developed when one's psychical energies have become fixed, as they do in the hysteric. Mobilizing these energies so that they're free to move about is precisely what enables the patient to get on with her life. But even beyond the theoretical similarities between the two, which show that overly simplistic readings opposing Foucault and Freud should be avoided, there are independent reasons to support psychoanalysis as a valuable practice for Foucaultians. This will be revealed by our political examination of, Foucault, of Freud's work. But in order to appreciate Freud's political accomplishments, we must first recognize that Foucault and Freud hold very different political aims. Foucault is trying to perform a genealogy of our current form of experience. He is not trying to fix that form of experience. Quote, what I want to do is not the history of solutions, but rather the genealogy of problems. Freud, unlike Foucault, is not interested in some abstract genealogy or in un undertaking the overwhelming task of shattering our current form of experience. Rather, 
Freud is interested in helping the modern self exist within the society into which it has been born and finds itself now stuck within. The importance of this aim can be better considered once we, once we, considered, once we have considered Hacking's theory of dynamic nominalism, specifically Hacking's idea that social changes lead to the creation of new categories of people, which in turn causes new types of people to come into existence. With Hacking's theory in mind, we can see that our centuries-long devotion to sciencia sexualis could lead to the emergence of a new category of people, the category of the self. That is, individuals began to think of themselves as a self. Thus, while Foucault might argue that the self did not materially exist prior to sciencia sexualis, the fact remains that the self is now a reckonable force within our modern world, and as such, aiding those with a problematic sense of self is necessary and admirable as a political aim. Foucault, in his condemnation of Freud's normalizing impulse, seems to forget that Freud never treated the happy pervert. He only treated those whose self had become a source of stress to them. The danger of psychoanalysis rests in its, rests in its extension beyond those whom it helps. For instance, it's possible that the happy prevert Someone like the Marquis de Sade, who existed before the label of pervert and as such never before saw himself as a pervert, would find that the creation of this new category negatively affects how he sees himself. Yet, concluding that this danger warrants one to discard all of psychoanalysis seems to throw the baby out with the bathwater, for it ignores all of the good that Freud is able to do for those who are suffering from their already existing sense of self. Thus, we should read Foucault not as calling for a rejection of psychoanalysis, but rather as warning us of a potential yet combatable danger. Quote, my point is not that everything is bad, but that everything is dangerous, which is not exactly the same as bad. If everything is dangerous, then we always have something to do. So, what is it we have to do? Ultimately, so long as we are careful, careful not to let these categories apply to us if we find them harmful to our sense of self, psychoanalysis is not problematic in a Foucauldian view. Foucault asserts that while he has always been suspicious of the notion of liberation, because if not treated with certain precaution, one runs the risk of falling into dangerous ideas, ultimately Foucault believes that, quote, the exercise of freedom does require a certain degree of liberation, because liberation is what paves the way for new power relationships. As such, it would be mistaken to try to read Foucault as making categorical determinations about psychoanalysis. Rather, it is more prudent to read Foucault as doing cautionary philosophy, recognizing the potential good a Freudian liberation can provide to some, while emphasizing the caveat that society must not become too taken in with notions of liberation, nor the temptation of regarding psychoanalysis as a hard science, which oversteps its limits by creating universal statements about human nature. It is only in this way that a conceptual space can be opened up for both Freud's and Foucault's theories to coexist, preserving Freud's legacy and allowing psychoanalysis to continue creating new modes of relation within sciences of sexualis, ultimately leading those who find psychoanalysis beneficial to a better survive in their current society by giving them a more forgiving and understanding relationship with their self. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. And our final paper today will be uh, from Gary Walls, who is a psychoanalyst in Chicago, who is the president of the Chicago Association for Psychoanalytic Psychology, and has been teaching and practicing psychoanalysis for many years now. Gary. Uh, I have to correct a couple of biographical remarks. I um, am not a psychoanalyst, although I spent more than 10 years in psychoanalytic training. I had children instead of uh, finishing that program. And I was president of the Chicago Association about 10 years ago. Uh, I'm still involved in that organization, but not as president. So uh, my paper um, is, I think I'm going to move to the lecture 
Uh, my paper is um, entitled Eric Fromm and the Concept of Alienation in Psychoanalysis. Over the course of uh, my practice of psychoanalytic psychotherapy, my thinking about clinical work has undergone a shift from wondering how to integrate psychoanalysis and politics to regarding them as inseparable. Historically speaking, politics and the study of human nature that we now call psychology were originally embedded within the category of the humanities or philosophy. It was only in the 18th and 19th centuries that separate categories of knowledge were carved out of the distinctions between science and philosophy, as described by Emanuel Wallerstein in his book, 1996 book, Open and Social Sciences. Significantly, the shapes of the disciplines that emerged were largely determined by the political pressures emerging from the French Revolution and represent attempts to organize and rationalize the great social changes that had occasioned. In this sense, the creation of a discipline of individual psychology was a political act, one that operated to obscure the roles that social institutions played in controlling and determining the fate of individuals, and which legitimized the laissez-faire economic policies and philosophies that were structuring the new social order in the West. Defining the individual as a unit of study and modeling psychology after the natural sciences made it seem inevitable to search for the explanations of human behavior in terms of the internal causal principles of the mind and brain, and to make the influence of societal arrangements seem extrinsic. The construction of the discipline of sociology, whose task was to study the dynamics of aggregate populations and the dynamics of social life in modern society, served further to delimit the scope of psychology to the study of individuals. Divorcing the study of social phenomena from the study of individual psychology created independent discourses based on different units of analysis, furthering the sense of incommensurability of the dynamics of individuals and the dynamics of society. The artificial divisions of the academic disciplines were, in part, expressions of the political and economic structures of emerging capitalist industrialism, and they constrained and compartmentalized thinking along lines that made it difficult to perceive the historically and socially conditioned sources of prevailing assumptions about the true and the good. It is not, therefore, the case that psychoanalysis is somehow apolitical, separate from and unintegrated with political ideas, but, on the contrary, that the structure of psychoanalysis is so embedded with political assumptions that it makes it difficult to extricate psychoanalytic ideas from the ideologies that rationalize the political economics of the status quo. The challenge instead is to create a socially and historically contextualized psychoanalysis capable of meaningful political critique. Eric Fromm was a member of the Frankfurt School until the late 30s when he broke with them because they incorporated Freud's libido theory into their political theorizing, and Fromm rejected the libido theory as anti-humanistic, failing to take into account that the most important activities of human beings were motivated primarily by non-biological strivings. Fromm's view of Marxism was strongly influenced by Marx's long-lost early work entitled Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts, which outlined a humanistic view of human nature in which man sought to realize his social needs in meaningful and free relations to others and to work. Fromm rejected Freud's thought that human beings were primarily narcissistic at their core and that they related to other people in order to fulfill sublimated sexual desires. Instead, Fromm believed that people were primarily social beings who fulfilled their own human needs that were social and, and, and which developed selves in the context of a set of social arrangements that we call society. And that one's personality was shaped by the forms that the political and economic arrangements of the society that we live in. He saw the family as the agent of society that transmitted the personal qualities that fitted or adapted into society. Agreeing with Freud that the earliest years of a child's life were the most formative, he believed that an authoritarian patriarchal society based on individual competition resulted in an authoritarian individualistic family structure that would lead to character traits that shaped the child to fit in with such a social structure. Fromm said, quote, society built on the power of one class over another produces a family structure in which the same authority relation is reproduced in the relation of the parents to the children. So that uh, loving one's father teaches one to love one's boss. Mm -hmm.
key concept that Crome used to bridge the divide between the societal and the individual in the consideration of human suffering was alienation. A concept that was key in Marx's theory of the effects of capitalist ownership of the means of production on man's relationship to his work, to him or herself, and to others. Fromm did not find Freud's concept of repression to be felicitous in describing the process of actively keeping mental contents unconscious, because it implied that all we need to become aware of was inside of us. Instead, Fromm preferred the concept of dissociation, which allows for an unawareness of either what is inside of us or the circumstances in which we live. Alienation points to a splitting off of awareness of both one's inner needs and also a lack of awareness of the nature of the societal arrangements in which he or she lives. Dealing with the unconscious, then, meant to help the patient to become aware of, to be able to live out consciously one's perceived inner needs and awareness of one's relation to the society in which one lives. Neurosis, therefore, involves both dissociated and unfulfilled needs of the self and the dissociation of awareness of the requirements and limits of the social world in which these needs must be met. In the state of alienation, one is split off from, and conscious of, one's human needs for relatedness to others, for the actualization of desires, and for a valued and meaningful expression of self-worth in the world, including the world of work. Under capitalist economic and political arrangements, alienation is prevalent because to cite one major reason, one's work is not typically freely undertaken and the product of one's work is not your own, but an expression of an authoritarian demand by the owners of the means of productions, the boss, executives, and the owners. Under capitalism, the production of commodities was governed by the creation of exchange value or money and not use value, which was the value of the commodity in terms of uh, its value in fulfilling human needs. In this sense, both the owners of production, capitalists, and workers functioned in a state of alienation. Commodities become fetishized as, as capitalism increasingly created artificial needs of many kinds in order to maximize profits and as exchange value dominated over use value. I practice from what Erwin Hoffman calls a relational sensibility, which is a form of psychoanalytic therapy that, like Fromm, regards people as primarily social beings, often called contemporary relational psychoanalysis. This form of, of the intervention emphasizes a therapy relationship that is less hierarchical than traditional psychoanalysis. It is described as a two-person therapy because it works in a matrix of not only the patient's transference, but the interaction between the patient's transference and the analyst's counter-transference. Instead of assuming the analyst is an objective, blank screen, and mirror the patient's psychological processes, relational analysis assumes that the psychoanalytic situation is comprised of two whole people, each with conscious and unconscious needs that they bring to the therapeutic relationship, and both of which must become conscious at appropriate times for the therapeutic work to proceed. One advantage of the relational model is that it shares with Crohn's approach, one, the, one advantage of the relational model that it shares with Crohn's approach is that it has the perspective that the, so, the source of the patient's suffering is not only unconscious internal conflict, but also the dissociation of one's social, economic, and political situation. Therefore, a greater attribution can be made to external factors as important areas for increasing consciousness in therapy. The patient is less blamed for his or her own suffering, and awareness and action within the societal situation becomes more relative to the understanding of the depression, anxiety, and lack of fulfillment that brings people to therapy. I would like to illustrate this with a brief case example from my own clinical work. Roger is a 43-year-old attorney who I had seen for many years for severe depression, as well as for the emotional distress and the interpersonal conflicts that attend what is known as a narcissistic personality disorder. During twice-weekly psychoanalytic therapy, Roger made progress in many ways, both in his career and in his intimate relationships. In fact, he terminated therapy after just 10 years. <laughs> because he was no longer depressed, 
He was successful in his career, and he formed a stable, long-term, loving relationship. Four years later, though, he returned with the reappearance of depressive symptoms. He related this to changes in his career. He didn't know why, but he'd become extremely unsatisfied in his work. He hated his law firm, which was always pressing him to increase his billable hours. Because of this, he felt angry, but also inadequate. He'd never been able to generate the hours that uh, the other partners he knew were able to do. He hated his boss, who he felt was selfish and, a selfish and domineering egomaniac. And I agree. <laughs> Even though he was a partner in the firm, uh, respected in his field, and making more money than he ever had, he felt unhappy, unfulfilled, resentful, and depressed. Uh, in other words, in a state of alienation, I would say. Roger went around in circles describing his complaints. We revisited the family dynamics that he'd struggled with the last time he was in therapy with me. Yes, they were playing a role here again, no doubt, but that was not all there was to it. And so with some trepidation, because as I say, my own perspective was evolving, I initiated a series of interpretations that connected his individual struggles with a bigger social context. I told him that in many professions in America, in the late 20th century, things were changing. When he first trained as a lawyer, the law firm was a partnership of professionals. Law services were not something to be advertised in order to, be, to create a demand for lawyer services or thought of as commodities to be shaped to accommodate the tastes of the consumer. The fact that they were regarded as officers of the court meant that their primary allegiance was to a system of laws and to principles of justice rather than to consumer satisfaction. Clients were not always right. The customer is not always right. In addition, lawyers determine to a significant degree the conditions of their work. They, not their clients or bosses, were considered competent to determine how much time a matter required and were obliged to perform up to professional standards that clients were entitled to expect, but generally not qualified to judge. Much had changed in the last 10 years, and it struck me that while Roger connected these changes to his increasing dissatisfaction with his work, his eroding self esteem, and his burgeoning depression, he did not see how these changes were the expression of broader political changes in American society. Law firms were being transformed into corporate structures that were run more like other corporations and less like traditional law partnerships, the law firms. Partners were no longer really partners except in title. They were really employees of the corporation. They no longer had much control over the conditions of their work. Um, job. Rush jobs on a routine basis were required no matter how long he felt it would take to properly research a legal matter. He was forced to prioritize clients by how much business they represented rather than by how truly urgent their problem was or who, who was in line first, who requested service first. He was expected to act as a salesman to drum up additional business from existing clients, in other words, to sell law services like any other service commodity. This firm began to design, this is incredible to me, I used to have these signs, his uh, firm began to design advertising posters, posters intended for the washrooms of upscale restaurants and bars so they could find a urinal. You could get their phone. This offended Roger, as who said that one of the main reasons he became a lawyer was that he didn't want to have to sell anything, which to him felt somehow debasing and shameful. And his opinion was no longer respected as legal opinions in general, no longer, no longer carried the authority with clients they once did. If an important client who represented a substantial revenue stream wanted legal advice as to their liability on a product or a project, it became Roger's job to devise legal cover for whatever they wanted to do rather than advise them against it. He worked in promotions law. I began a dialogue during his sessions to make the connections I just described above. As Roger came to understand the changing structure of the practice of law in a large law firm in contemporary society, he did not become less dissatisfied, but he became less depressed. His feelings of conflict with the superiors had work intensified, and he entertained fantasies of confrontation, which he by and large uh, managed to avoid. He came to realize that if he wished to practice law according to his own values, he would have to give up the security and other benefits of a large law firm. Over the course of about two years, he eventually left that law firm and set up an independent practice or solo practice. For me, this case illustrates the need to understand a patient's symptoms in a political and economic context. 
Uh, Rogers' symptoms were a reaction to political developments in society, namely the, takeover, the corporate takeover of law firms and a consequent commodification of uh, professional services in law. They were invalidating his identity and some of the values in which he had become invested in in becoming a lawyer. I don't believe he was wrong to resist changing along with the field of law. To maintain a feeling of integrity in response to the changes in the way law was practiced in his firm, Roger needed to examine his political values, the new societal arrangements, and increase his awareness of the political and economic realities of the world in which he was now uh, uh, forced to practice. For Freud, the formation of psychological symptoms and their meanings could be fully understood in a symptom in which the dynamics of instinctual desires and interactions within family relationships vary, but the cultural and political context were regarded as fixed and universal. This worked for him because his patients lived in a social context that varied across a narrow political and cultural range in 19th century Vienna and Europe. We now realize that a therapeutic approach that assumes a fixed and universal societal context results in a therapy that includes unacceptable elements of indoctrination based on dominant ideologies, much of which is conveyed unconsciously, as in Lynn Lake's uh, notion of the normative unconscious. It also does not do justice to um, the treatment of um, uh, minority cultures or non-dominant uh, cultural um, patients. We need to develop theories of therapeutic process that include societal context as co-determinative of the meanings of psychological symptoms. Zizek, uh, for one, has discussed the parallel of Marxist theory as interpreted by Lacan to Freud's theory of symptom formation, and I'm also almost done. From this perspective, psychological symptoms are created when irrational elements, internal contradictions, and the way society is organized are rationalized ideologically and disavowed in order to cover the conflict of interests involved. The disavowals of societal conflicts, say between classes, creates a fissure in the consciousness of its citizens that holds at bay the eruption of interpersonal disputes over the conflicts of interest. Instead, individuals internalize the conflict as a split in their own political awareness. The unlinking norm, which is another one of Lynn Layton's ideas about the unconscious demand to unlink the individual and the societal, is a name for the societal force that motivates this fissure. When the relations of domination and servitude are dissociated, they reemerge as symptoms such as depression, anxiety disorders, alienation, anomie, and narcissism. In this way of thinking, the psychoanalytic model is extended from a theory of symptoms that represent compromised formations expressing and disguising unconscious, instinctual, or relational conflicts to a theory of how psychological symptoms may express as well as disguise unconscious societal and political conflicts. Such an extension expands the power and reach but also the risks of engaging in psychoanalytic therapy for both the patient and the analyst. Thank you. So we've had a remarkable tour this afternoon this morning, this morning, of, um, of the relations between uh, psychoanalytic thought and um, Frankfurt School, Goffman, Foucault, Eric Fromm. Um, so I think we have, we have quite a, a lot on the table um, to discuss. And um, we're going to open it up now for questions and, and comments and conversations and uh, exchange. There's a microphone that uh, we have here. So um, anyone who wants to open the conversation is free to start. Jeremy, your um, presentation is about what, like, specific orientation for social science research, like, what that would entail. But I want to ask, and you sort of said, like, here are the axioms, let's see what follows from them. But why should, you know, if you imagine yourself as, like, someone who is, like, trying to seek a method for social scientific research, it seems like I can think of, like, a number of reasons not to pursue the line, I guess, called critical theory. I wanted to work through some of these practical reasons and then propose at least a possible different alternative Let's see what you have to say about that. The first is I think it's mentally depressing. I think the assumption that there's like 
the barbarism is this the case that it is, is like producing negative psychic side effects, which I think you can actually see in people who do critical theory, that their lives are less productive and having the most of different assumptions. The second is that it's alienating from your peers. If you, if, if you are in a position to say, as Adorno did, we stupefy ourselves, that means that the speaker does not stupefy himself because he can see the stupidity. Otherwise, that statement is unsayable. So it seems like that direction between sort of the, uh, the speaker and then the subject produces like an inevitable priestcraft and like tradition between humans that's unnecessary and actually sort of like runs against our everyday moral assumptions. Uh, the third is that it obscures potentials. So if you see society in a state of rot, what you may see as rot may in fact be the emergence of a new order. And it's like, if what you see, like, any time before new orders come, there's like widespread social decay. And if you're going to focus on that decay and call it death or barbarism, you see death or barbarism and not the potentials that have emerged. One good example of this is how, like, unable critical theorists are to understand the demise of the patriarchy. Like, it's one thing I don't think, like, uh, Western Marxists really understand, the salience of, like, the loss of a father-oriented society. Gertrude Stein said in, I think, like, 1920 or something, that in 100 years, no one will have fathers. And she's very, she's very happy about this. She was happy about the, the prospect of a mother-led society. Um, and then the fourth thing is that uh, to see the crisis in society as, like, social problems and problems of knowledge and not ethical problems involves, like, I think, like, a, an alienation away from our everyday sort of, like, moral responses. So the critical theorist doesn't see problems in society as like ethical problems of the same, like they see them as like problems of knowledge that need to be accessed by truth, as opposed to moral situations that need to be rectified by action. Um, and then the alternate vision I would propose is like, at the same time as the Frankfurt School was doing its social research was the highlight and sort of the, the deepest flourishing of the Black Mountain College in North Carolina, uh, where you know there were social researchers, artists, musicians who came together it wasn't a non-critical program. They were thinking, but they were also producing. There was a mode of action as opposed to reflection. So I guess I would put forward this vision as against one that you know, seems inherited entirely from an authoritarian Prussian university. So. <laughs> uh, should I go ahead? Yeah, OK. Um, so OK, I'll try to address all of that. Um, first of all, about the stupefaction. Um, I'll keep the depression for a moment, but about um, about the stupefaction, um, I'm not sure why that's necessarily the case, right? So it seems to me that there are plenty, just on a normal everyday level, there are plenty of people who recognize and in fact want to spend their time knowing more about the society. Or say that, like, I would know more about the society, you know, if I weren't, like, too busy with XYZ, or if I didn't, you know, find myself kind of constantly turning into the more convenient television program. Or, like, I'm not sure self stupefaction inherently, or the, the claim about stupefaction assumes the greater intelligence of the one pursuing it, it would actually, it would seem to me to be sort of the opposite, which is the claim that it takes a lot of energy and concentration sometimes to keep oneself thinking about the society as a whole, because there are lots of very good reasons, in part the depression it induces sometimes, not to do so. And so therefore, trying to create a space where people can do that is like a valuable service that some people can do for others who in fact like find themselves, again, like conflicted about whether they're gonna undertake that project or do things which are, say, more superficially pleasurable, but at, the, at, at bottom still leave them with some deep dissatisfactions. So I'm not sure that assumes the necessity of a priestcraft in the way you were describing. Um, then on, do you think that like to one in practice? Hmm? Do you think it leads to one in practice? I can see why you say that, but if you think about critical theorists and their attitude towards popular culture, it seems like, what I'm saying may actually have a lot more practical import than like a theoretical one. Can you expand just a little more? Just think about like what's involved in Adorno talking about astrology, right? That's a good example. So Adorno, of course, didn't understand astrology, so he's just writing about one very limited type of astrology. But because Adorno writes this very influential book about astrology, everyone who does critical theory looks down upon anyone who does astrology, right? So this is an example of how theories of like greater or lesser knowledge allow like like hierarchies within academic practice. Again, I just don't think like I'm not sure why that's the case. It's always the fact is any social practice has a truth to it, right? I mean the truth the truth is in the whole, the whole is false. So for like for Adorno, any social practice literally has to be approached 
as something that expresses truth about subjects, about their comportment, about what they want, about what they need, about what they're not being allowed. But you may have like substantive differences about his claims about what truths are offered or blind or not offered by you know various social practices, popular culture, um, more generally. But I I don't think axiomatically that gets you to the point where you have to be you say contemptuous, for instance, right? Um, that's, that's, I think, what I would claim on that. I think the, the practice question is important, and I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, I think fundamentally, like, it's, I, I agree to some degree that it's, a, it's an academic model, and the Institute, I feel, was very honest about that, and that's why I appreciate their efforts. Like, unlike a lot of contemporary um, academics who claim instantaneously that the work they're doing by the papers they're writing is a political practice, more or less, like, you know, you see, basically, in a lot of Adorno's essays, for instance, his claim that what I'm doing could provide sort of the basis for a new curriculum. So, for instance, he talks about that and um, about the personality research, the authoritarian personality research, uh, that this is for anti-fascist education in the United States, and the group experiment stuff for anti-fascist education in Germany. So, there was some sense where he thought, actually, you know, and again, this is like liberal reformist stuff, he had maybe more dramatic ambitions, but he did think that there were potential practical implications of this kind of work, even very important ones. He just didn't necessarily think that structurally those could be so easily combined given the state of American and German politics at the time. Um, if, if now is a time where that's like fundamentally different, I mean, to some degree, like that's why we ask people working in education, et cetera, to come to the conference, because I, I do think that like the hermetic seal um, but, you know, that everyone's allowed praxis except us um, of critical theory is, is not quite right for the present. But on the other hand, I'm sympathetic to the worry about the, the practical issues dictating the depth of the studies, and thus, therefore, to some degree, there's some danger of, how should I put it, like uh, curtailing ambitions, curtailing utopian ambitions that might be available to people taking up the research. Yes. Um, I, I, I'm going to direct my question to uh, Gary. Um, Gary, uh, do, do um, last night uh, Dr. Hoffman uh, kind of did a, 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 an analysis of what goes on in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a consulting room between analysts and analysts on them and, and and uh, you know he came up with like three three kinds of really bad kinds of things that happen there as a result of you know the, the kinds of the kinds of presumptions that uh, analysts have the end of it and and he thinks it's it's buried deeply within the, the whole cycle psychoanalytic enterprise individualism you know pathology orientation and and uh, and and the medicalization and. Uh, I ask this question, and, 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 and what, what you did with Roger, the lawyer, seems to me, you know, addressing that individualism question where, where um, you try to, you know, uh, uh, contextualize the situation, make it larger, show him that there were um, uh, structures, you know, having to do with, and changes in, in the law profession that impinged on him. and. and and directly contributed, maybe even caused, uh, large large parts of his of, of his depression. And I think you're right because I've had a similar thing. I was I, I mentioned this last night, to, you know, in, in my question. I was a milkman, and um, you know, I I won't go into the details, but I, I I was in therapy at the same time as I was a milkman. And I was having severe problems with my boss, you know. I and 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 I was beginning to adopt a Marxist uh, interpretation. You know, I was a middle class student, and then you know joined the working class, and the scales fell from my eyes. And I I, I could see from my direct experience the, the the you know class nature of our society, which you know which had been masked from me. As a result of you know college education and being born and raised in, a, in an upper middle class family, now it, the interpretation that my analyst gave, right down here in the University of Chicago in the early 70s, 
or the one he encouraged me to adopt, was one in which um, my, my, my growing awareness of class relations in society was seen in terms of my, my uh, you know, my, the, the, the uh, really unpleasant and, and maybe pathological relations I, I had developed over time with my father. That it, they were an expression of my, um, uh, uh, you know, the pathology in my family. And that I was you know, having these grandiose notions of ruling class versus the exploited and so on, in which I identified as the exploited because I was a child and had a very poor upbringing, you know, with respect to my father. And that I was, out, I was, now, this was really informative to me. And I, I, it was very valuable to see this. But was there something in that interpretation, you know, it, it, that, that I adopted myself, yeah, that, that, is, that is profoundly anti-political and, and designed to uh, deflate um, and rob me of my, 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 my another sense of my, my, you know, my growing awareness about my society. You know, in, in other words, bringing in a social, a social context does it end up kind of like melting away individual pathology? Because after all, I go to the therapist, I go to the, the psychoanalyst, don't I? Because I'm in distress. You know, I've got personal distress thing, you know, that are that are harming my my married life. So I'm there as a willing participant. But do I walk out a stronger and committed? Unionist and political act, activist as a result of being in therapy, or in, in a sense of my heart, does, does Freudian analysis supplement me and make me stronger as a political activist, or does it rather rob me of something that is, you know, that is really critical, namely this, this sense of outrage and, and you know, raging against the machine, you know, that, it, that, that drives the fuel of, 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 of political commitment. I mean, that was, I, I thought that was an excellent uh, question you asked last night, and I sort of think so. Uh, you know, that's why I think that, that you need to analyze at both levels, because it, you know the family is the agent of society, and you and you can relate to how your own father um, maybe dominated you, um, suppressed you, crushed you, and you had issues about that. You were angry about this uh, authoritarian parenting that you received. And maybe parental rejection as well. And those are things that need to be acknowledged and recognized and worked through because you don't want your actions, feelings, and thoughts at, at work or in, in your union to be so inflected by personal concerns that displace, in terms of displacement. At the same time, um, to reduce, say, for instance, uh, um, young black males' anger and say, well, you know, there are a lot of black males who are really, really angry at authority. And they're out there doing a lot of aggressive, violent things. And, and, and you get them to therapy and say, you know, really, basically, it's because your father, you know, beat you or abandoned you and all this other stuff. That's a problem. I think you have to acknowledge both the familial, interpsychic suffering, which is idiosyncratic and personal, and the fact that you're a human being within a society and that they're reflective of one another and that a lot of your anger and rage exists not only in your family but in society and needs to be preserved and strengthened and encouraged so that you are enabled and um, encouraged to act as a citizen and not just as a personal um, Does that address what you were saying? Yeah. I just sort of follow up a question to this. Um, and especially hearing Gary Ross saying that you have to speak to both sides. Um, but we were speaking from, or representing Eric from say this relational therapy, and he cuts up the libido theory. And I'm wondering, especially for someone like the Frankfurt School, or even Julie's presentation on Foucault, um, how you might lose, um, do you think anything is lost by cutting out libido theory as, as part of that one component of what's going on in um, individual dynamics, and also do we lose out on our interpretations of social social um, phenomena by cutting out the libido 
theory. Well, I don't see how we lose out on social phenomena, but, but we may lose out on Molina theory in the sense that from didn't, you saw that there were certain fixed biological needs, hunger, thirst, um, and sex, but he didn't see that um, human, the human beings were primarily motivated by fixed biological needs, that the kind of human motivations that people, that make people's lives meaningful uh, are social and are not derivative or sublimations of sexual desire but in fact, um, derivatives of attachment needs and, and, um, and that our social needs and needs for self-esteem, for example, these are not fixed biological needs, but are needs which are constructed by our participation in society and the fact that our very selves are never autistic or narcissistic and at the core as Freud would have it, but from the very beginning, our selves are constructed within the matrix of an interpersonal relationship with the mother and the father and so forth, and therefore don't need to be derived from some biological uh, uh, need like sex. So yeah, you lose something in terms of the centrality of the libido theory, uh, but what you gain, I think, is a more humanistic and expanded appreciation of what it means to be a person. And you can understand more about how human suffering um, can only be understood beyond the fixed biological needs and in terms of how one how one's fulfillment as a person happens within a societal context which contains many contradictions and conflicts of interest. Just I want to weigh in a, a little bit on, on some of the things. That, I just wanted to go back to, to someone saying that it was to Gertrude Stein and, and the question of mothers and fathers, because I'm not absolutely sure that we've gained that much from the loss of the I mean, We've gained some things from the loss of the patriarchal father, but we've lost some things also. And again, kind of bring up the idea of an interaction order that in some ways have become more diffused. And it's almost harder, I think, for people to cope with than the interjection of that patriarchal authoritarian father. And I think that that speaks a little bit to, to the issues that you were raising about popular culture and sort of the nature of the stupidification. Because, because it's, it's buried in that interaction order, which is not only the patriarchal father who turned out to be a lot of other things. And I think you, you could almost cite Reisman here in the concept of the other director person that's been fused into popular media it's been fused into the peer group, and it makes it even more difficult to reconstitute a politically, a politically competent person than it was when there was only the patriarchal, when there was primarily the patriarchal father. I just want to go back to that. If I can really just quickly respond, I actually think, um, and I was going to say this to Ben and I forgot, um, I do think the Frankfurt School actually was ahead of their time in the sense that they were very concerned and did a research on the changing family form and the decline of fathers in Germany, and you know were committed to broadly like the end of the family in a Marxist way, but we're also very concerned about the way that instead people seem to be more directly um, socialized by things like the authoritarian education system. We're just swooping them up and actually developing them seemingly into less independent personalities than they were when they had been under you know one daddy's foot. Now they were under like the big daddy yeah, society really like, as a whole. Didn't mm -hmm. the sixties. I mean, the weird thing is that doesn't that formation is false. Like the, the German like democracy was like was the flourishing period. So it's like it runs up against some empirical wall. Uh, German democracy was no. The sixties was a reaction against how unflourishing German democracy was. Well, that's that's a flourishing democracy, right? That, that was like, a new generation. I mean, they were doing their research on a generation. This is this is actually I think a, to some degree an empirical question. I think an important empirical question that analytic social psychology should be doing about the family structure in the world now, like what it means for individuals? Uh, not right now. Okay. But I okay. Right. Great. There was another question in the front here. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, just. Well, no. we've gotten away from what we're talking about, so I'll pass. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering about the attitudes of, uh, in the States, you know, between uh, the Democrats and the Republicans, 
convention. I watched both of these conventions, and there was uh, uh, a, a lot of difference, you know, the way people feel, the way they think, and uh, I'm just curious uh, how come uh, the country is so split in their attitudes and uh, what makes uh, people uh, think the way they do. I mean, that there are some attitudes that are, uh, 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 how come there is such a difference, you know? Uh, in, uh, in attitudes and values, and uh, the nation has similar values, but at the same time there is a, such a difference. Oh, if anyone can answer that. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I think in, in a very broad sense, they're not that different. Democrats and Republicans are not that different, and they're both supporting some form of neoliberal economic policy and neoliberal development. So, of market-driven development. So I think in a broad sense, they're not all that different. I think there, there's increasing polarization, again, I think it has to do with media processes. Uh, Cass Sunstein has written about this, that the internet and other media have helped polarize interaction among people who agree with each other, and that there's less and less of a kind of common forum to discuss uh, policy questions and so on. That there's, there's been polarization through media media consumption, producing two uh, sort of somewhat superficially different versions of, of the basic ideology. Yes, next question. Yeah, I have a question about, uh, and this is to everyone, kind of the forms of practice which you imagine psychoanalysis should be embedded in going forward. You know, I think one theme that kind of goes across uh, Freudian thought up to Fromm is this idea that psychoanalysis is kind of articulating things and making them public, whether that's a sexual conflict or that's a socioeconomic conditions. But under the Freudian model, there's also an epistemology that would say that through the transference, that's the way that those conflicts would be made apparent. It's, so the form is very much tied to that epistemology, whereas socioeconomic conflicts, you could address that in multiple different ways, and maybe not, they may not even be best suited to therapy. Um, so, given that, I'm kind of wondering what, where do you imagine psychoanalysis should be embedded, what types of forms of practice moving forward, and also just to kind of connect it to the Frankfurt School, uh, do you think of that Freudian uh, epistemology and how that applies to social science research where they're trying to really focus on analyzing transference or different things that might happen in those interviews, but it's existing outside of that form where you would build the transference relationship over a long period of time, what, from a psychoanalytic perspective, what might that mean for that research? I think we should all answer that. It would be interesting to hear it. That sounds like a good idea. You want to get the microphone's by you guys. One <laughs> thing. <laughs> okay. Okay, I, I think I think Gary should start because we want to address therapy mostly. Are, are you are you interested in therapeutic practice? Yeah, or even sure. just does uh, this therapeutic practice? What role does it even have moving forward in psychoanalytic thought now? Uh, particularly if there's like less of an emphasis on libido theory and transference and more of an emphasis on you know socioeconomic things. Like, does therapy still have a clear role or? Well, I wouldn't say uh, that there, like, analytic there was more focused on political, economic, social things per se. I think that, um, on the one hand, it's been recognized that the, that there was a uh, myth that needed to be um, dispensed with that the you know, this high, this one up that the analyst is the one who knows. The analysts can keep their unconscious under control, even though everything they know about what psychoanalysis tells them says that we all have an unconscious, and we're not conscious of it, and that it's going to enact itself within the therapeutic relationship, and there's no avoiding that. And that, that, that the analyst who practices that their blank screen, objective, detached mirrors are deluding themselves and are doomed to enact their unconscious rather than become aware of it and make choices about what they want to do with it. Secondly, they're going to mystify their clients by the fact that they hide themselves 
and enact their unconscious rather than discuss it with their, their patients. And you can't really understand the transference except in the context of this interactive relationship with the countertransference. One thing that this does, and, and also by opening up the, 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 the relational perspective to not only what's inside based on internalizations of family experience, uh, but to, to the fact that we also are influenced by our families as agents of societal structure and society, or our actual interaction and lives out there in society and outside of the family, that um, we, uh, we empower necessarily psychoanalysis to be able to do more things, um, but not, not to, to lose uh, the ability to um, address the personal, familial, idiosyncratic parts that were traditionally addressed as like I would inject a word into the conversation that Jeremy kind of put it in there at the beginning, and that's the word falseness and false consciousness. I know that this opens up a huge can of worms, but I want to open it up uh, because I think there, that's a parallel between what Marxists do at the societal level and what the psychoanalysts can be doing with the patient. That something has gone on that is false, that the patient, that the patient is developing neurotic symptoms, and we all have some of those, although some are more clearly constituted as hysterics or other kinds of neurotics. That something has gone on that has constituted this false text about the world that is then leads to false kinds of performances, like I'm going to do what my boss wants me to do because he's whatever. To, to that kind of structure, and so that there's a linkage in this notion of falseness from the family context into the larger, into the interactive context of work, into the larger societal context. And I know that saying the word false, false has become a little bit out of fashion, but I think I want to revive the word. Here, um, so maybe what we should do is this. I, I see two more questions. Maybe we could have them both, and then um, I could ask all the panelists to kind of give some concluding thoughts. So, one, well, now we got three. Okay, so let's do the, yes, one, two, and then three, okay? And then, and then we'll have the panelists dig their concluding thoughts. But I'm thinking about uh, the notion that it's science of sexualis that constitutes the modern notion of selfhood, and this was described as coming from Foucault. And I'm thinking of that against Marx, who I think suggests that it's rather the individual's participation in a society where uh, it's, it's the commodity form that mediates individual and society that constitutes modern notions of selfhood. So I thought you all might want to comment on this a little bit. Uh, is it sort of either or, neither both? Um, and especially what are the political implications potentially of uh, that divide? And specifically, I'm thinking of the work of uh, Christopher Lash and Richard Sennett, who show that I think the self in the 20th century goes through various permutations, such as narcissism, um, and also under uh, like flexible, more flexible labor regimes that, to my mind, can be more easily explained through a broadly Marxian framework rather than a kind of psychoanalytic one. So I'm wondering if you could um, comment on that a little bit. Yes, that's that right behind you. Um, I have a question about uh, both from the title of talk, consciousness and society. I'm wondering how like consciousness is known as the hard problem in philosophy and science, etc. Basically it's called the hard problem because no one can figure out what it is, what the conscious, etc. How do you reconcile that with your community with a client? And the most recent developments in society, science says we really don't know. How do you uh, interact with a client? Do you let them know that psychoanalysis is a collection of models or maps and language games like the code said? How do you um, how do you deal with that? It's kind of a big question. And then second, okay. uh, Eric Fromm. He was really close to the guy who did who was a Zen master, Alan Watts. And psychoanalysis basically talked about the ego self. Like a kind of skin capsulated ego. How do you 
makes sense all the other new developments that say like there is no such thing as a separate self in neuroscience or all these fields. Um, okay, so, yeah. Alright, thanks. You want to Uh, so my question is just for, um, I guess, for everyone, but for Julia and Jeremy specifically, and it kind of gets back to that question at the beginning. And um, I'm curious about, and it actually goes back also to Pisani's talk on Friday night. I'm curious about the potential of psychoanalysis for, you know, something like the Frankfurt School, where it's a matter of being able to like understand these destructive forces and being able to critically diagnose um, social pathologies uh, versus the notion of psychoanalysis as a kind of like listening that allows things to emerge, like new orders to emerge, to be attentive to them. So I'm curious if you two might want to comment on perhaps the differences or similarities between the way you see critical and Frankfurt School, critical theory, understanding psychoanalysis versus um, uh, the way that like Persani or somebody inspired by like, a Foucaultian perspective, what see new orders emerging um, might be that. And if criticisms one might have the other. All right, and then we have one more. This is actually what I was going to say a little while ago, but I got an example of an individual who got into psychotherapy, um, psychoanalytic psychotherapy or psychoanalysis, I'm not sure which it was, and an outcome which was related to society. He began realizing that it was a gay man, began was not a therapy with me, um, but talked about this with friends, um, became, realized how angry he was at the way gays were treated in society, kept wanting to get rid of his anger, he thought it was right, he should be able to get rid of it, but he just couldn't get rid of it. He went round and round and round in his psychotherapy, finally began realizing he could do something about it. He could channel it into political activism, which is what he did. All right, so then let's have some concluding thoughts. Uh, Julia, do you want to pick this up? Uh, sure. Uh, with regards to your question, um, I mean, I guess, I guess coming from a Foucaultian perspective on it, I think Foucault would say that both Marx and Freud represent the same type of false promise and liberation, um, and that both, I don't think it's mutually exclusive that we have to pick the self coming from CNS and sexualis versus the self coming from Marxist. I think Foucault would say they come from both insofar as our reliance upon science and sexuality is in some ways determined by the social changes in cultural society and capitalism and the capitalist system. Um, I'm trying to think where else I was trying to go with this. Um, but that being said, I do think even if it's a promise of false liberation, it can be helpful insofar as, like I said, the self is, based on Hacken's theory of dynamic nominalism, a substance within our society now that we have to deal with. And if it's a therapeutic practice, psychoanalysis does provide people with some sort of comfort or does aid them in certain ways. I don't think that Foucault's analysis disregards that we have to invalidate psychoanalysis for Marx. Um, I'll try to address some of what was said. Uh, sorry if I stuff I leave out. Um, on the form of practice, which I think is a great question, and it goes back to Ben's question too about the sort of research institute model and its relationship to universities and sort of just know the truth, like that's that's what we can do. Um, fundamentally, I think that's totally inadequate. And in, a, in you know the right forms of practice, if I had to like talk for a minute. Um, or just imagine for a minute it would be something like a radical political party with um, massive educational cooperatives and experimental institutions with like what Wilhelm, Wilhelm Reich did with uh, bands that drove around a working class neighborhood and gave people safe, gave people safe spaces to have sex in. Um, the, uh, you know, a, a whole network of institutions and the, the research wing would be a wing exactly of a broader project where people would be coming to be able to think about themselves in safe spaces and start to have more control over their destiny in both a personal and a political way. Um, so if I, you know, I'm dreaming big and I completely recognize the extreme limitations talking about analytic, um, any sort of research, 
And I think it's it's good on us to admit those limitations in a very honest way and not imagine that it can be more nor less than what it is. Um, regarding uh, um, Marx and Foucault, uh, the basic thing I think I'd say, I, I know Julie's paper is great, she convinced me. Um, I, I think fundamentally, you know, clearly um, 20th century Marxism, and I'm curious to know, I mean, Foucault said later, late in his life, um, had I known about Weber and the Frankfurt School, I would have done a lot of things differently and taken a lot of less detours um, when I was young. Um, which is like a very provocative comment uh, that, that he didn't follow up on. We have no idea what he meant. Um, so I, I can imagine what I think he meant by that. Um, I have done so before um, on occasion. And it seems to me that what both Foucault and the Frankfurt School were clearly dealing with was the way in which, um, despite sort of active resistance and claims to liberation from economic compulsion, despite to some degree class politics, um, there seemed to be a complete consolidation of, especially the state, um, in the 20th century, and the forms of knowledge and the forms of self-identification authorized by the state. So for Foucault, this is you know governmentality and the, the power of the state to identify, put us in boxes, etc. Um, I think that to some degree you can have like it's true that the Frankfurt School fundamentally came towards that same problem from a different direction that believed fundamentally in the, the notion of liberation and its importance um, and looked at the self less as a, a, you know, a prison and more as actually something quite fragile and almost lost in a state-led society. Um, but I, again, I mean, I think, I think there's a lot of commonalities actually, but that the, perhaps the critical intent is a little different. Um, finally, what I'd say uh, about, oh, the emergence of the new. Um, that's a great question, and also a great characterization of the Foucault-Frankfurt um, School distinction, the same one I was just talking about, actually. I, was, I, think, I think that's right. I mean, to some degree, it, is, it has been the critical strategy, um, starting from Marx, to look for the new as emerging out of the death of the old. And, you know, uh, Nietzsche has a line that I like a lot, which is that um, conscience is a sickness, but a sickness like pregnancy. Um, and so to think that as you look, as you examine the sickness, you'll actually be able to see the newness. Um, the danger, I think, that the Frankfurt School was worried about was that phenomena that actually were just symptoms would be taken as radically new offshoots or new developments, or even uh, taken affirmatively, whereas the, the true scope of the transformation that was possible would be sort of missed. Um, I don't, you know, I, I don't think it's a hard and fast rule. Um, I think, to some degree, that's that's the question we have to understand: what, whether the things we are seeing are new or are they repetitions of the old again and again? I think that's a fundamental question of psychoanalysis too. Um, I would say that, uh, from the point of view of a therapist, that um, what I get from Foucault is a value to me is that he historicizes everything and and de-essentializes everything, including social practices, one of which is psychoanalysis um, and the understanding of human suffering, um, that, um, that Marx um, is of value. Integrating Marx into psychoanalysis helps counter the hyper-individualism and the internalized inner world that Freud overemphasized, the biologism of Freud for example, and places human beings in a social, cultural, political context. Um, and it's a corrective um, to the reactionary conservative politics that got it, were unconsciously, without awareness, enacted in the psychoanalytic process, such that in the 40s and 50s, women in New York would go to analysis with depression, and their analysts would tell them that, that they're unhappy because they're, they have penis envy and they're trying to be a man and they should go home and get pregnant and raise babies. And, you know, I, I think only by putting psychoanalysis within a broader social context, um, such as Marx, Marxism, um, you know, broadens the context for the work that one can do as, a, as, a, as an analyst or a therapist.
Um, I think there's a deep unity in what we're talking about, a kind of connection between the structure, text, performance, and the body. I don't think the body can be left out, and that's why I have some concerns about dumping the big dump theory on that one. Uh, and both of those on you. And just the deep unity is there, but I, it's good that we're having these conversations. I think there's an enormous amount of work to do at all of these levels before we see a society that's better than the one we're headed for right now. I guess the one thought I had to the response to the question about Marxism was simply the panel itself, the reason why we're doing this discussion, the, the array of thinkers that we've talked about, whether it's the Franklin School responding to Marx and Freud, or it's Foucault responding to Lacan and Althusser. Um, I mean, this seems to be just this sort of ongoing sort of way of trying to think about interior, exterior, the self, the social. Um, even Professor Rosani's work, um, you know, thinking about human modes of relationality. So, I mean, while his obviously focuses on sex, sexuality, um, I think what he suggested to us on Friday evening is to, in fact, take that model and expand it out and say, well, what other modes of relationality beyond, say, sexuality could we think about? And I think that's sort of this ongoing question that is, that everyone here on the panel is trying to grapple with and the questions that seem to be reflected back is this notion of, well, how do these sort of perspectival aspects all come together? Do they form a whole or don't they? But it seems to me that in some sense they do, and yet you know, it, it needs a conference like this to bring folks together to actually start talking across these these lines so that the, the therapeutic and the social critique are really one of the same. Wonderful. All right. Well, I want to thank all our panelists and all our questioners. Thank you very much.